Google does have control of those data centers. We can now compete them by creating a free market. The biggest value proposition, we can provide a service that's 50% cheaper than everything else that exists. When they talk about onboarding the next billion, they point that it's decentralized, censorship resistant. The reality is that that's not going to be enough. There's a lot of barriers to entry. What's the value that this thing be decentralized does for us? Why should anybody care? care? What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Next Billion Podcast, where we're talking to the entrepreneurs, the builders, the people that are doing awesome stuff, particularly on Solana. And we have, as usual, someone who fits all of those descriptions and categories and everything like that. We have Frank from Genesis Go, aka the Shadow Drive Storage, aka a whole bunch of other different things. And uh, Frank, great to, to have you on the podcast. Today. Yeah, no, thanks so much for having me. Excited to, uh, excited to chat today. Absolutely. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about. And this is actually a new topic. We've, I don't think we've really, well, we haven't spoken to, to anyone, certainly as, as in-depth as what you guys are doing. Um, but before we get to uh, decentralized storage and that sort of thing, maybe I always say, let's, let's start from the top. What's been your journey thus far in, in crypto, either from the entrepreneurial side or, or just personally in general? Like, What got you into this clown show to, to begin with? I love that question. Because I think, you know, it, it hits on what makes like Web3 and crypto like so special. You know, so my partner and I, we come from, uh, you know, very like traditional TradFi backgrounds. Uh, I was a uh, financial planner for 10 years. I spent um, part of that, you know, leading a team of financial planners uh, with um, a couple of large brokerage firms. And uh, my partner, you know, had the uh, almost exact same career track. Um, but, you know, we both still like... Um, super sciencey math nerds at heart and tech nerds at heart. And so, you know, for us getting into uh, crypto and Web3 was um, all about, you know, we, we just kind of stumbled across like Solana's, you know, unique technology and what they were doing, um, you know, proof of history. And we just found it so fascinating. And uh, next thing we knew, you know, basically we found ourselves building a validator because we wanted to like learn how the tech work. And then, you know, we got into, um, you know, running RPCs and, uh, dabbling with NFTs and building NFT standards and, and you know, launching our own NFT. So, uh, yeah, for us, it was uh, kind of a winding path that led us here. And again, I think that's the exciting thing about Web3. Yeah, it seems like it started on the tech side where you sort of got into it. You got into it in the deep end yeah. where you went straight into validators <laughs> and, and the, the hard stuff, right? The, yeah. uh, I guess the more, the more tech engineering focused stuff. Why was that? Was that just because that's where the interest was and you were like, hey man, this is awesome. Like, I just love this whole concept of consensus and stuff and let's, let's try and build a product here. Like, what was the impetus? So you just sort of sat down one day and you're like, hey, you know what we're going to do? We're going to do something with validators. Yeah, it, it's exactly what you said. It was the tech. We thought the tech was so interesting that we just couldn't help ourselves. We just started digging into the validator code, started trying to understand, you know, the mechanics of what's happening, you know, in like the Solana Turbine, how they aggregate votes, you know, how the leader schedule works, everything like that. And uh, yeah, next thing we knew, you know, we were buying parts for uh, a machine that we, you know, like dropped in a local colo to run a validator. And uh, yeah, it's like I said, the tech for us, it was the tech. It was all about, you know, blockchain and what blockchain technology, what distributed ledger technology is capable of doing, you know, for society. Nice. So I guess that the journey is sort of starting there on in the deep end. You said you did NFT stuff as well, wrote an NFT standard. What was behind that? Like, I think, and this was this was years ago. So was this pre-Metaplex and pre sort of any standardization of NFTs or what was... What was the sort of lay of the land? Yeah, we, we kind of took a stab at it. There was no like standard at the time. It was just, it was again, it was just us exploring the tech. And, you know, it didn't like go anywhere. It didn't amount to anything. It was just uh, Stephen and I tooling around basically in the code while we were also, you know, tooling around inside the Solana source code and, and uh, you know, working on building and improving the RPC network. And that was kind of like, you know, an impetus for Genesis Go as it is, you know, now uh, and the team that we have now, you know, building an NFT standard about a year ago. But um, again, just and that was, you know, post Metaplex and everything like that. But, you know, that also kind of stemmed from a uh, love of the tech and wanting to be, you know, dig into an area that you know, obviously very impactful. Yeah. And I guess as well, like in the last few years, certainly NFTs have have been a thing. And in the bear market, it's maybe what has helped save the relevance of Solana, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. through, through those days as well. So I think very relevant, but, um, you know, moving forward into, we're talking decentralized storage and, and stuff like that. Tell us about what was, I guess, the genesis of, uh, of that and how did that come about? Was that um, a sort of maybe a learning from the NFT side of things as, hey, where is the JPEG actually stored and 
how are people managing this kind of stuff? Or was it something more fundamental? Yeah, so it was a learning from uh, our time, you know, being like the largest RPC provider on Solana for a while. We powered the vast majority, like kind of in the, what was that, summer of 21 NFT craze? Uh, or maybe it was 22. Yeah. Um, it's been 84 years being in working Web3, so it's hard to keep them straight these days. <laughs> I love the name. Can you right. the name here, please? Uh. Thank you. Um, but yeah, you know, when uh, when the Solana Summer NFTs were just, you know, popping off, everybody was doing drops, you know, uh, DJ and Apes Academy had just dropped, things like that. Uh, you know, we actually ended up powering a vast majority, like probably at least 80% of the NFTs um, that were dropped over the course of that time period. And, uh, you know, the thing for us, like, you know, we love working with RPCs, but one of the reasons why we started working with RPCs was because we basically said, like, we don't want to have to be smart enough to come up with, like, the next great idea. We want it to run yeah. on something, you know, on infrastructure that we build. That's why we've always been drawn to infrastructure. And, you know, RPCs, that was our, our gateway. But uh, we very quickly started to think about like, OK, you know, but what's like what's fundamental to everything? Right. And at the end of the day, it's data. It's bytes that are either at rest or bytes that are in motion. And so uh, that kind of epiphany for us, that was the genesis of uh, us beginning down the path to building Shadow Drive and to building a new kind of decentralized storage protocol. Um, and ultimately, uh, what will evolve into its final form as a you know new kind of decentralized cloud platform. And, and the concept at, at that stage of decentralized storage, I think, had been an established thing. We've had mm -hmm. like storage. We had ASEA. I remember some guys from Boston or whatever were doing that. Um, so the, the concept never really sort of hit off. But maybe you want to sort of what's the overview of why this matters? Like, why should we be using? some sort of storage thing on a blockchain and why is that a good idea versus, hey, can I just go to dropbox.com and press a credit card button or yep. something like that? Like, Yeah, so one of the catalysts that people uh, like to refer to when they talk about, you know, onboarding the next billion into Web3 is they like to point as the, at things like data storage, right? And they, they point to things like, you know, look, it's decentralized, look, it's, you know, censorship proof or censorship resistant or, you know, it's uh, or whatever. And the reality is, is that that isn't not it, that's not going to be enough to onboard the next billion people, right? Um, there's a lot with the existing data, you know, decentralized data storage solutions. There's a lot of barriers to entry. There's a lot of hurdles that that people have to jump through. A lot of hoops they have to jump through. And there's also uh, a lot of limitations from a performance perspective. So, you know, for us, one of the big things that we like drilled in on very quickly was to say, like, okay, we're asking people to accept, you know, we're asking users to accept worse performance. We're asking them to accept, you know, like all these hoops that they have to jump through. Why should anybody care? And, you know, the answer can't be, well, because it's decentralized. Because that doesn't mean anything, right? Because like you just referenced. Doesn't mean anything. Doesn't mean and anything. Like does, nobody really cares or they don't understand. Certainly someone new to it, it's like, I don't know what that means. Right. <laughs> like, that's How do I even quantify that? You're, that's exactly right. It's the, And it's how do I quantify that, right? What is that? What's the value that this thing being decentralized does for us? And so, you know, for us, when we were kind of started going down this road, we basically said, okay, first of all, the ticket to play period is that if, you know, decentralized storage is going to matter, it has to be as performant as existing cloud storage solutions, right? That has to be there because nothing gets off the ground until you can check that box. But then, you know, after that, it's a question of, you know, again, you come back to the like, okay, so it's as good as everything else that's out there. So again, why should people care? And we kind of started going down with this thesis that decentralized networks, they should be significantly more cost effective if done right than anything else that's out there. You have a, a network of decentralized operators that are effectively all taking ownership of small amounts of the network's expenses in exchange for, you know, a certain amount of return. Is that because of the, the thinking that, so one, one school of thought, one argument could be, hey, Google is efficient because Google has their own data centers and they control that and, you know, they have complete control over all of the cost basis of all of that versus, okay, if we have a decentralized network, well, we don't, mm -hmm. but maybe that creates competition that, well, hey, if I have much lower costs of being able to provide more storage to the network, maybe I'm going to outcompete people. And it kind of, it's kind of like Bitcoin mining that... Mm -hmm. The, the person with the best hash, hash power, you know, gets the largest share of the network, gets revenue and so on. And, and you sort of, you have this competition that builds upon the economic security of Bitcoin and stuff. So is that a similar kind of concept uh, with the sort of economic side of things of, okay, like Google does have control of those data centers. 
but actually we can now compete them by creating a, a free market for anyone to come along and try and do better. Yep, that's, that's exactly right. You know, the same way that Bitcoin was created to decentralize the infrastructure of big banking and big finance, we're building Shadow Drive to decentralize the infrastructure of big tech cloud companies. And, you know, one of the things that's important to, uh, to keep in mind, right, is, you know, to your point, like Google has a ton of resources, right? AWS has a ton of resources. They can throw storage at things. They can offer, you know, uh, competitive prices and things like that. But the thing that they have that's kind of an anchor for them, thing that they have that uh, acts as a headwind is they also have shareholders they have to answer to. They have a responsibility and an obligation to always be increasing profits, always trying to be figure out how can they uh, increase profit margins and uh, post better results quarter over quarter. Whereas in a decentralized network, right, and this is where the architecture of Shadow Drive stands out as truly unique, you know, like the technology is decentralized and we're building a decentralized network, right? But there's several others out there, but there's no other network that decentralizes the revenues attached to that. They get rewards and tokens and things like that, right? But uh, Shadow Drive's built to literally take all of the revenue streams that the platform generates and decentralize them out to the users. And referencing back to what I said about shareholders, you know, if you have an operator, especially like you think about this economic environment, right, where everybody's talking about inflation and everything like that, somebody who's able to like turn on their computer, store some data, serve some requests and make even as little as like 100, 200 bucks extra a month, right? They're going to be so thrilled with that, right? You know, as the network grows, like them being able to say like, you know, I made a thousand bucks this month storing data without any hoops to jump through, without any worry about token volatility or anything like that. Like, that's my rent payment. I'm able to make my rent because of what's coming in because I'm participating in this network. That doesn't have to then grow every single quarter type of thing, the same way it does with like AWS or, or Google Cloud. And that's part of why I say, you know, decentralized networks, the biggest value proposition, in our opinion, based on our research and the math that we've done digging into um, revenue streams of cloud platforms, is that we can provide a service that's, you know, 50% cheaper than everything else that exists out there. And true to like kind of the um, democratization ethos of Web3, it's a win for everybody, right? Your individual operators win because, you know, like if we capture less than 1% of cloud revenue market share, that's hundreds of millions of dollars per year split amongst the network operators. They win, the consumer wins because they're getting a network that has just as much performance, but the, you know, what's in it for them, the why should they care, is the fact that they're saving tremendously on their costs as well. And I want to drill into the mechanics of that as well. Like you've spoken about a lot of different things there, the revenue incentives, the the structure of rewarding. So tell us, how does it work? There's a token involved. Mm -hmm. The token is the revenue stream. What's the, I guess, market mechanics for making that a thing? Because I guess what some of the, the different concepts that have been tried in the past, I think, I haven't looked at storage for a while, but I remember back in the day, they were a little bit more centralized and things. People were like, hey, it would be great if, uh, you know, I could pay for my storage in the token and I could, um, you know, get rewarded in the token and like, no, you have to go through our company and that mm-hmm. sort of thing and didn't really quite work out. Had SEER, which was just a lot of different hoops and, and different things. But I think the the idea of the token being fundamental to that structure of money flowing between people that are paying for data and people that are serving data. But how does that work? What's the what's the steps? What's the mechanics? Yep. So the token, you know, the shadow token, it is it is uh, the mechanism by which the network is secured. So if an, somebody in order to be an operator, you know, they have to stake shadow, you know, into the network, right? That it basically says, you know, like, okay, I'm a valid operator in the network, but also it provides a financial disincentive for malicious activity or things like that, because, you know, there's a slashing mechanism, right? So, um, you know, we borrowed from Filecoin, right? Which has Filecoin operators, they put up a certain amount of escrow in, in, you know, the Filecoin token. And then that amount of token, you know, that can be taken away from them if they're not performing, if they're basically not upholding their obligations, right? And so it's kind of, you know, one aspect of it in the sense that that's how we help protect the network. That's how we help identify. We're using the cryptography of the token to be able to actually, you know, link somebody's uh, identity. So all of that's, you know, well and good from the network perspective, right? But of course, there's, you know, 10 people who aren't going to run shadow nodes for every one person that is, and they're going to be asking, well, great, but how does this actually benefit me? You know, our platform is built in such a way where we are saying, like, we want to directly tie the growth of like user growth, revenue growth of the platform to the token, right? So as uh, as revenues are sent to the shadow operators, right? Let's say, you know, just you make it easy. So, you know, for every dollar that's paid by a customer to the network, 
70 to 80 cents of that is sent directly to the shadow operators. The remaining 20 to 30 cents is used to buy shadow directly from the markets and then, you know, deposit that into the uh, emissions contract for shadow operators, you know, and things like that, right? But what that's doing is because all of this is handled programmatically, like, as you said, like, unlike uh, other platforms like, like Storage A or things like that, where it's much more centralized, the teams require is, you know, like they're the ones that make these decisions. Everything happens on our platform programmatically. So as revenues grow on the platform, that 20 to 30% of constant buying that's happening, that's also increasing, right? So you said, you know, for every dollar, 20 to 30 cents. You know, so now as we're making, let's say, you know, as our annual revenues climb, right, to, or our monthly revenues climb to 10,000, 100,000, a million, right? That's 20 to 30% of each one of those uh, little earmarks that is you being used to basically provide a mechanism that creates ever increasing buying pressure in the markets on the token. And this is why we tell people quite often, right, that uh, short-term market movements in the token, they don't matter because that's not where the value comes from, right? We hear a lot of feedback, right, around like, you guys should be spending more money doing marketing things. You guys should be, you know, where's the the hype? Where's this? Well, the platform yeah, is the a, hype. It's a nebulous it's a a nebul- thing. Oh, do more marketing. What does that mean? Right. Like, and nobody has the answer. They're like, well, I know that they should do marketing, but I don't actually know what that means. And they're like, oh, well, why don't you buy some Google ads or something. And it's like, you really think that's the best marketing spend? Like, yep. do you know anything about anything? Right. See, what marketing means to us is go get customers, go win business, yep. right? That's where our marketing dollars are going to be spent as we push uh, Shadow Drive V2 live here in, you know, the latter part of this year, right? That's what marketing and building hype means is, you know, generating an increased user base, generating increasing monthly recurring revenues, because that's the only thing that matters because of how we built the platform and because of how we've done the tokenomics for Shadow, right? There's um, one of the things we got a lot of feedback on when we first had our IDO with Shadow was that, you know, that it's a very low supply. It's a fixed supply. There's no more that will ever be created. And we got a lot of feedback from people who were, you know, they were kind of, they, they were confused. And we were just like, you know, just wait. And now, you know, as uh, as we continue to progress, we you know, we've, uh, have uh, Testnet 2 is, is live. People are participating in it. We're seeing people start to put all the pieces together. And that in and of itself is generating the hype, right? But yeah, the most important thing for us is basically being able to say that, yes, if you're a holder who's not participating like in the network actively as a storage provider, that's fine because you're still benefiting on the growth Platform. I, I love this concept and it, I'm Thank you. so happy to hear that, that other people are doing that. I mean, that's that's what we've been doing, similar things at Step mm-hmm. with buybacks tied to revenue and stuff like that. And it's like, man, I don't know why more projects aren't going down that route. I mean, ultimately, a Web3 project you've got to think of as kind of like a business in that your job is to provide a good product. Now, why do people use good products? Well, it's because it makes their life better in some way or, or whatever. And, and if more people use your product, where do the benefits accrue? And ultimately, I think a lot of protocols kind of don't know the answer to that. They're like, oh, yeah. maybe it's, I don't know, LPs or yep. is it token holders or I don't know how to do that. But it's like the ultimate goal is if you can grow the revenue of the network, then that is by default the best outcome for anyone who's either a token holder, a node operator, anyone that's consuming store, doing whatever you're doing. Like, you know, the point is that you're able to, to get a share in, in that growth, yep. which is great. And that's why... You know, I think these kind of networks can outcompete some of these centralized sort of operations is that everyone's sort of in the same boat. The incentives are aligned, yes. right? So I guess, do you see that this helps? We're talking about marketing. Mm-hmm. So getting the word out to more people is if everyone's excited about this and everyone's like, hey, man, if, if I go and get more people using this and I go and tell the other, I don't know if you're a startup, I'm in a co-working space right mm-hmm. now, a bunch of different startups there. If all of them started to use decentralized storage, and great, that's that's more participants in the network that actually benefits the holders as well. Like, do you see that that's kind of like a growth metric that um, people talking about it kind of begets more users, and then more people talk about it, which begets more users, and that's the sort of what you're going for? Yes, prime example of this, right? Like, you know, one of the reasons why we're so confident that we can like build a user base, build a customer base, right, is we've done it already, right? We built literally from just two guys with one server into the largest RPC provider on Solana. And I say that because that is important for like when you think about how it is that you can build a marketing, like an organic marketing base underneath you. And the example for that is when we launched the uh, the Shadowy Supercoder NFT, 
one of the pieces of feedback we got from that uh, uh, in the weeks coming up to the NFT launch from people that were joining the community was, well, I don't see enough hype. You know, where are the giveaways? Where's the whitelist? Where's this? Where's that? We weren't doing a lot of things that traditional NFT launches up to that point had been doing. And we're basically like, chill. We got it. Don't worry. Well, what I had hoped was going to happen is is what happened is that, you know, our customers of our RPC networks, we had put so much time and effort and energy into helping support them, helping, you know, like launch, helping them launch their project, providing customer service, you know, just at any time of the day that we didn't need to go build this massive discord following because every single one of those platforms that we've been supporting, they started going into their mm-hmm. own discords for on our behalf. So we weren't popping into everybody's discords all of a sudden be like, hey, everybody check out this upcoming Mint. Uh, We had, you know, the founders of these projects saying, hey, everybody, we want to really support these guys. That was one of the thought processes behind the design of the NFT itself, where we had like the monitors, right, with the logos of all the different projects that have been using our network. We wanted them to have a vested interest in making sure that the NFT sold out, right, because now that's just more distribution of their logos. And so, uh, you know, to your point, like that's the exact same tack that we're taking with uh, with Shadow Drive and, and, and V2 is, uh, you know, whether you're a customer or whether you're a, uh, a provider or just a holder, you have a vested interest in trying to get as many people to use this thing. Right. You could be a customer who also is contributing storage. And just by that right now, you're paying your storage costs because of what you're earning from the network. I gave an example on a talk that I was doing uh, couple of months ago about, um, you know, this is something that's really beneficial for school districts and universities because, you know, summer break rolls around, everybody leaves, they're still paying their monthly contracts for whatever they owe their provider that runs their computers. And they're like, all that's just latent compute and storage that's doing nothing. They could actually put that to use. And so, uh, yeah, no, you're hundred percent right. That's exactly the play that we're working on. And for you, the, what's the target market. I guess you've got a lot of different types of, of users, right? You've got people who are, I want to store my pictures somewhere. You've got people that are, I want to be a node operator. You've maybe got holders as well. I mean, what is, you're building the product and who are you focusing on? And maybe that's, you know, V2 is maybe addressing some of those things or, or doing something there, but is it everyone with a mobile phone that can, uh, you know, go and, and do something? Or um, is it everyone with a PC? Is it university networks? Like, who or what is the ideal customer for you guys? So that's the beautiful thing about doing storage, right? About doing cloud services is that the ideal customer is everyone. You know, like when you think about Google, right? Google's cloud platform, they have modes of, uh, in which anybody can access their platform. So I have, you know, Gmail, right? I have, you know, Google Drive on my phone. I have iCloud. It's like, there's all ways that I just am able to interact with their storage, use their storage, everything like that. While at the same time, they're putting their efforts into going and winning, you know, like large cloud contracts. And so uh, there's an element of automation that's going to allow us to target every mobile phone user, everybody with a PC, every your individual, you know, your grandma who's just storing pictures somewhere, right? Because we've built the network in such a way where there are no crypto specific barriers to entry. The crypto aspects of it, they're all running behind the scenes because, you know, your, your consumer shouldn't know, they shouldn't care. I don't need to know the specifics of how, you know, Visa's network operates. I just need to know my credit card's going to work, right? But, you know, kind of on the same path is the power users, the business entities um, that will eat up massive amounts of storage that they need, you know, constant loads of compute and things like that. And those would be, those would be where, like, you know, our team is spending their, like, direct time focusing, right? So our target, like, user base for the team's effort is going to be a lot of Web2 companies. You know, we'll start going to a lot of the more traditional Web2 tech conferences that, uh, you yeah. know, that you see, like, Adobe at, AWS at, and everything like that. Those will be the things that, you know, the uh, the crypto space, like, they don't see that, right? They see breakpoint, they see crossroads, um, and everything. And we'll be there, too. We'll be, you know, advertising there, too, participating there as well. And, you know, like, like Crossroads, I'm super excited about Crossroads, right? Um, Let's go. Oh, yeah, it's going to be awesome. May 10th to 11th, by the way, SolanaCrossroads.com. <laughs> Definitely be there. So, yeah, you know, like, the, all of those things, they're all on the table for us. But, you know, as I said, our goal, our, our mission is onboarding people into decentralized yeah. technologies so that way we can really show that this is actually a new step forward in technology. It's not just about DGENs on the internet posting on Twitter type of thing. I think, man, it'd be so cool. You guys go to a Web2 conference or something, put up a banner that's like with 50% of the cost of AWS for storage. Yep. 
and then just see what happens. And then you'll get probably a bunch of boomers in suits coming up to you being like, oh, what is that? And what is it? it's like, oh, yeah, we do this crypto thing. Yep. And they won't quite understand it, but they'll realize that, okay, we should maybe pay attention to this. I would love to be a, a fly on the wall in, in something like that. Yep. But, yeah. like you guys have seen a lot. You've been around for, for many years now. You've weathered a, a bear market in Solana where it seems emerging into bright new sprouts of glorious spring sunshine <laughs> uh, in terms of markets. But what are you looking for in, in this year? You mentioned a new version of, of the Shadow Drive or maybe just Solana in general, mm-hmm. DeFi in general. What's the direction that, that you think things are taking? Yeah, so for, for us specifically, like that's an easy answer. You know, it's deploying V2, which is, you know, the full, like it's the full final form of the Shadow Drive platform. V1.5, which is the platform that's live right now, it's always been a placeholder for us, right? But once that's deployed, uh, it's for us, it's it's all about customer acquisition at that point. So that'll be how we spend the last half of the year is uh, just focusing on growing the user base. I think Solana is in a very like exciting spot, in my opinion, because, you know, we've had just like kind of like Solana goes faster than all the other chains out there. It seems like its evolution has also just flown by relative to other chains. So it's like we had the the period there for like, um, you know, Solana summer where everybody was like losing their minds by how exciting DeFi is. Then we moved into the, you know, the NFT craze. And, you know, there was a ton of, I mean, a ton of rugs, a ton of um, just fake projects out there and things like that. And we kind of zipped through all of that. And, you know, from my perspective, what I've been seeing over the past uh, six months or so um, as like we kind of like started to see the bear market pull back is um, there's a real appetite for like actual tangible things. There's a lot less of that, like, I don't care if this is a a scam or a rug, I'm still going to mint it, right? Or I'm still going to buy the token. We're seeing those projects that can't articulate like what their value is. We're seeing them not do as well. The ecosystem has become a lot less forgiving of uh, projects that are rushing, you know, that they're giving a bad platform experience or a bad user experience. Um, and I think what that's saying is that the ecosystem as a whole is, is maturing, which is very beneficial for, you know, creating a massive new way of onboarding for, uh, for new users. And so I, I kind of expect that trend to continue. I expect Deepin to, uh, to continue to be like a, a focus because ultimately that's like we're, we're in this infrastructure laying phase right now. And so I think we're going to see that trend continue for the rest of the year. And from that, I think that's when we'll start to see the really exciting stuff happen of just new and crazy innovative platforms being built on top of the infrastructure, you know, like Shadow Drive that's being built right now. That's a good point about Deepin. You know, I think that is maybe something unique to Solana. Mm -hmm. We don't really see, I guess, Render came across from Ethereum. I think they were like a 2017 ICO or something. And but the, the whole stuff with Helium and the stuff that they're doing and that sort of really cemented Solana as a place to do that. And I guess Shadow Drive is another example of Deepin in that it's decentralized infrastructure for data. I guess, do you see that has, a, that has legs, that sort of narrative? And I, and I guess it's not about narratives, it's more, you know, you're focused on, on getting users. But do you think that Solana seems to be the place where a lot of these projects that maybe have these physical infrastructure networks will find a home in? And if so, why? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, don't get me wrong, right? Narrative is super important. Our, everything that we're using to acquire customers is all narrative based, right? It's all based on like the value that Deepin has to offer. You know, I think to your point, like people underestimate the importance of fast. And because Solana is fast, you know, what I think one of the reasons why you're seeing Deepin projects from other chains migrate here is because they're starting to realize what, you know, what we realized when we decided to build on Solana um, is that, you know, if you're going to onboard actual users, if you're actually going to grow a real user base and you're going to build a project that's capable of competing with like the Web2 versions of whatever it is you're building, your users have to have the same experience, period. Like that is just, that's it, period. Uh, full stop right there. If they don't, they won't switch. They won't use your platform. The only thing that you'll ever attract are, you know, just the, the very niche individuals that they're coming to explore. And this is a, it's a cool thing that they're willing to check out. And, you know, maybe they get excited about it. But those individuals also never fully switch because of the fact that you can't actually win a customer with an inferior product or a product that has inferior infrastructure underneath it. And I think that's what um, Solana is allowing Deepin projects to do is kind of get rid of that uh, that limiter 
of having infrastructure underneath that is like so far behind in terms of performance of all existing Web2 infrastructure that the benefits that, that decentralization bring to the table, they're not even like, you know, worth talking about because of the fact the user experience is so much worse. And I think I've, I've certainly been in that category where there's been a, a project or a thing that's launched in crypto land. Mm-hmm. It's probably an inferior product to some Web2 type thing. I've used it and I think it's cool, mm-hmm. but then I never actually deploy real money or use it every day or integrate it into what I'm doing and, and stuff like that. So I guess the, the challenge is to build something that's just fundamentally better uh, as an experience. And uh, that's sort of the starting point. So I would say, where do people go to, to find out more? Is it discords? Is it Twitters? Is it blogs? Where does the community coalesce? Yeah, so uh, you can go to um, all of our resources are on the, the website, uh, shadowdrive.com, uh, S-H-D-W, drive.com, or you can go to genesisgo.com. But that's where we have kind of like, you know, the uh, all of our community documents, you know, our blog sites located there. The blog is a great resource um, for articles that we've published, like uh, how does Dagger, our you know internal consensus mechanism, how does that compare to the likes of Filecoin, for instance? And, uh, you know, from there, you can find links to our Discord server where uh, the team, you know, we're very active with our community, actively answering questions, goofing around with them, that type of thing. So, uh, but yeah, check out, you know, just the main website uh, or our Twitter page um, at Genesis Go, then uh, all the resources are there. Absolutely. Love to hear it. Uh, We'll put links to all of that as well up down below wherever it might be. (laughs) Um, But uh, so thank you so much for for your time today. Definitely go and check out Genesis Go and all the really cool stuff that they're doing with Shadow Drive. These guys have been OGs in Solana for a long time, build an awesome product. I think it's the right mindset to have. You've got to A, build a product for for people and just being a superior product that people want to use and B, align sort of token incentives with network growth. I think that's that's a really good thing as well. So, so definitely go check them out, join the Discord. And uh, yeah, thanks again for, for coming on the podcast today and uh, all the best. Thanks so much for having me. Cheers. 